Okay, uh, our last speaker today is Dr. Rishi Chowdhury, Assistant Professor of Neurobiology, Physiology, and Behavior and Mathematics, and a core faculty member of the Center for Neuroscience. Dr. Chowdhury's work across a variety of questions and approaches ranging from studying general theoretical principles of neural computation to modeling specific brain regions to developing methods to analyze large neural data sets. Dr. Chaudhary collaborates closely with experimentalists and works on mathematical questions that are inspired by problems in neuroscience. Dr. Chaudhary will talk about cracking the neural code with machine learning as we look ahead to an exciting future of advanced technology that can improve health and quality of life. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Rishi Chaudhary. So hi, everyone, um, and thanks, Tim. I'm thrilled to be here and to talk to you about some of the exciting ways in which artificial intelligence ideas and machine learning tools are really helping us understand the brain. <coughs> so, you know, to give you some context about myself, I think I started off life wanting to be a mailman. When I was about six, I discovered physics. And so from like six to 21, I really, really wanted to be a physicist. And as I was studying physics, I got more and more interested in complex matter. You know, just these moments when matter starts to self-organize, um, starts to do increasingly complex things, you know, and ultimately ends up you know, giving rise to all of this. Um, and so in that sort of physics journey, I think I converged on really the most complex piece of matter I can think of in the universe. Well, I don't know the universe, but the most complex piece of matter I can imagine, um, and that's the brain. And so over here, I'm showing you a picture of a tiny, tiny piece of human brain tissue. It's you know, the width of a human hair, so really, really tiny. And this is a reconstruction here, you know, and sort of zoomed in. And even when this tiny, tiny piece, we have all of these neurons just kind of intertwined talking to each other. And, you know, and this is repeated across the structure of the brain. When you put it together, there are billions and billions of neurons all connected to each other, sending signals to each other. You know, it's really hard to look at this without a sense of awe. Um, and you know, everything we are, everything we think and feel, emerges from the collective activity of these billions and billions of neurons. You know, so how do we even begin to make sense of a system with billions of interacting parts? It's like trying to make sense of humanity. And often the way I think about it, it's like there are these billions of neurons that are talking in a language we don't understand, and we need to crack the code. We need to figure out what they're saying to each other. And this is even harder because, you know, imagine I want to figure out what humanity is thinking, but I just have access to a few audio recordings from a grocery store in Davis, listening in on 200 people. Maybe they're not even speaking the same language. I don't know why they're there. We have a similar problem with the brain. There are these billions of neurons we're listening in on the activity of some small subset of them. We don't know if they're speaking the same language, what they're saying, why they're there. And somehow, we need to put together these pieces and figure out, you know, what's the code? What's going on? What are they saying to each other? And so I'm a computational neuroscientist. And the way computational neuroscientists try and help study this problem is, I think, in you know, three main directions. The first thing we do is we try and build theories of what different parts of the brain are doing. So we might say, oh, this part of the brain is you know, scanning my visual field, trying to pick out things that look like faces. Or maybe this other part of the brain is trying to get rid of noise so I can recover my memories effectively. So we build theories that sort of guide what we look for um, in these conversations the neurons are having. The second thing we do is we build models we try and you know, take what we know about the lots of interacting pieces and put that together and say, can we reproduce the behavior of the system as a whole? And so that helps us go from these lots of little pieces to some large scale collective behavior. And then the third thing um, we do is we build data analysis tools to really look inside data and try and test these models and theories. Because you know, the way science works, most of the time your models and theories are wrong. Um, occasionally, they're correct, but there needs to be this loop between your data and your theories. So there's been a big change relatively recently. Until recently, our models were comparatively simple. And so I'm using an example from one of my papers when I was finishing up graduate school. You know, I'm very proud of this paper, 
but it's by today's standards pretty simple. And so in this paper, we took what at that time was a really large data set of connections between a bunch of brain regions, shown here in these colors. And these are the connections between regions in the brain, each of which is colored with you know, a different color there. And we built this large scale model of interacting brain regions and simulated to see what we could reproduce about how areas of the brain work together. And over here, I'm showing you one of the things we learned from the model. It's kind of a picture of how a brief input changed as it went from sensory regions in the brain to cognitive regions in the brain. And what we found was, you know, we found an explanation, we think, for this idea that sensory regions respond quickly and forget quickly, while cognitive regions of your brain really try and gather information over time to make decisions, store memories, plan for the future, and so on. You know, as you're talking, to, as you're listening to me, part of your brain is keeping track of every little syllable I'm saying, every little word, and part of it is looking for the context, looking for the whole sentence, trying to put it in the context of the talks you heard before, and so on. These seem like different parts of the brain, and we had, you know, we were able to link some features of the connectivity to these different functions. So I thought it was really cool, but you know, by today's standards, this is a tiny, tiny model. And in the last few years, there have been really two parallel revolutions that are changing the ways um, we do computational neuroscience, the ways we think about the brain. The first one is the so-called artificial intelligence revolution that I think Tim set up really, really nicely. Um, we're increasingly building agents, intelligent agents, that are able to do really complex things that used to be you know, the sole preserve of human brains. The magazine cover from 2016, this was when you know, computers beat the world's best Go player. Part of the reason this was significant was for years everyone said, oh, Go is too hard to solve with a computer. This is a magazine cover from um, last month. Um, you know, th this is ChatGPT. I think Jim, uh, Tim showed you a sonnet composed by ChatGPT. Again, you know, these are making headlines all over the place. The second big um, revolution was the so-called data revolution. And so the plot over here is comparing all the different ways we have to measure brain activity at a variety of scales, going from really, really fast millisecond time scales all the way up to days and months, um, and at different spatial scales going from single synapses to the brain as a whole. This was in 2014, so it's already out of date. Um, and this little inset here is showing you what things looked like in 1988. And so we have this whole family of new methods, you know, like the ones Lynn talked about, that let us probe, manipulate, image the brain in ways we just couldn't before. Even within a modality, we have access just to more and more data. So this graph over here is showing you the number of neurons in a study, the number of neurons people were able to observe over the year, and it's growing really, really, really rapidly from you know, a few neurons at a time to thousands. People talk about this like a Moore's law for neuroscience. You know, Tim recently told me that in the last six months, he's recorded more neurons than in his whole career to date. So we're just getting more and more and more data. And so these two revolutions give us a set of new ways of studying the brain. You know, following these two things, the AI revolution and the data revolution, um, give us two new approaches. One is using artificial intelligence as a model of the brain, um, basically taking these intelligent agents and now studying them as another model system, the same way we might study a human brain or an animal brain. Except unlike a biological system, we have complete control in this case. We can you know, dissect these brains, we can change things, we can like, move things around and see what happens. And then the second approach is taking all of this big data we're collecting, putting that together with machine learning tools, which you know, are ideally designed to pick up structure in these big data sets, and using that to help decipher what all these neurons are saying to each other you know, and why. And so what I'm going to do for the rest of this talk, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the first approach, AI as a model of the brain, a little bit about the second approach, machine learning plus big data, and then I'll talk about you know, three future directions 
that we're working on that I'm excited about. Okay, so most common AI architectures are so-called neural networks. And the structure of these is inspired by the structure of the brain. Now, this history goes back a long way. This is an example of an early neural network. And if you just look at it, it's already talking about sensory units and response units and so on. Um, but over the last you know, 70 years, this has gotten more and more complicated, larger, more intricate. And so this is a more modern image recognition network. And again, if you look at the terminology, things like fovea stream, you know, the fovea is the center of your eye. These are very, very brain inspired. A really nice place to see this is in these image recognition networks. So if you've ever used your face to board a plane or unlock your phone, or if you've ever dealt with you know, image tagging software, these algorithms use these so-called image recognition networks. And these image recognition networks are modeled on the structure of a visual system and really recapitulate a lot of that visual system. And so this picture over here is showing you on the top it's showing you a schematic of our visual system, in particular the ventral visual stream, the sort of what pathway. And what happens is you're looking at a picture, it comes into your eye, and it gets passed through these series of processing stages. And you have neurons that are looking for increasingly complex features. So early on, maybe neurons are looking for like tiny patches of dark versus light. And then you stack these, you go up this hierarchy, and you start to have neurons that are looking for noses and eyes and so on. And then one step further, you have neurons that are able to you know, recognize your grandmother or your dog or something like that. At the bottom is one of the artificial neural networks. And from the way it's drawn, you know, you hopefully you see that it's really trying to model this in a similar way. You have these layers of processing that get more and more complex as you go on. And they build from simple representations to more complex representations. Um, and eventually are able to recognize images. So it turns out now that we can go full circle and that these image recognition networks actually help us understand vision in humans and animals. You know, you can look at activity in these artificial networks, and it turns out that they often match brain activity better than our best hand design models. You know, so depending on you know, what your job is, that's either really exciting or sort of depressing. You have a lot of smart people who built a lot of careful models. But it turns out these more big data approaches, copying the, copying the broad architecture of the brain, but then just training it to do things that brains do, gives you a very good model of the visual system. And now that we have this very good model of the visual system in a computer, we can go in and we can change stuff. We can say, what makes it more and less brain-like? Does it make the same mistakes people do? You know, what are the differences? And we can really start to look for principles of vision from these systems. OK, so that was a brief um, but hopefully evocative example of how we are using studying artificial networks to think about what biological networks are doing. The second leg is driven by this data revolution. And it's this idea that we can use machine learning tools on big data to really decode this conversation, figure out what neurons are saying to each other. Um, so I'll use an example from my work. And we were studying these neurons in the brain that are called head direction neurons. Head direction neurons are like a little internal compass that help you decide which way you're going. So you know, are you going this way? Or are you going that way? They've been found in a lot of species. People study these in bats and flies and mice. And they're a really important system for a few different reasons. One, they're a very simple example of memory. You know, I can shut my eyes and keep walking, and I roughly know which direction I'm going in. And the second thing is these kinds of navigational systems are often the first to go in things like Alzheimer's. Um, and so, you know, understanding the sense of direction is both a really important fundamental computation and possibly of clinical relevance. OK, so we have this system. That's like a little internal compass, so it's keeping track of which direction I'm going. And if you think about the directions I'm going in, or you think about the outside of a compass, it's like a circle. And so there were all these theories of the system you know, for decades that said, basically, if you were able to look at the conversation these neurons are having in the right way, they're encoding something circular. 
they're basically collectively saying, hey, we're going this direction, you know, not that direction, and the set of options is just a set of angles. And so we went in and we used some geometric algorithms to learn structure from data. Um, you know, this is what the data actually looks like. These little ticks are when the neurons are active. And this is actual data. We were able to show that if you look at it the right way, you can actually find a ring. So this is cool, but it needed two pieces. You know, it didn't just need the algorithms. This would not have been possible if someone hadn't been able to record a whole bunch of neurons at once to really figure out the conversation, because you can't figure out a conversation from listening to only one person if it's a conversation among multiple people. Okay, so I told you a little bit about kind of two approaches, one using artificial agents to think about biological agents, and two using machine learning tools and big data to try and decode this conversation, to find the hidden patterns in the data. Um, and now I'm gonna talk about just three research frontiers that I'm pretty excited about and that sort of use these ideas. Um, the first is thinking about what gives the brain its remarkable robustness. The second is building brain-inspired computing systems. And the third one is using some of these generative AI models to think about how the brain learns distributions of things, comes up with new possibilities, and so on. And so I'm just gonna talk you through each of these in turn. Okay, so one of the cool things about the brain is that it's this dynamic, robust system, and that parts of the brain can control each other, compensate for each other, and so on. You know, when I get up to give a talk, if I'm a little bit nervous, I start to speak a little bit too fast. Another part of my brain can detect that, kind of slow things down, space it out a little bit. If I'm a little spacey and I'm like, you know, need to do something, I can pull myself together. If part of my brain gets damaged, another part of the brain can sort of compensate, can step in. You know, something like a car can't do that. If part of your engine's missing, another part of the engine's not really gonna take over. You know, computers definitely don't do this. They break at, you know, the slightest excuse. But the brain has this, like, wonderful, dynamic, robust ability to kind of compensate and correct for stuff. And so, in collaboration with um, Tim here, we've been trying to take advantage of new methods of recording from lots of brain regions at once, and new machine learning data analysis tools. And so we're taking the data Tim records from all these brain regions, we're fitting these big machine learning like network of networks type models to try and capture what each area is encoding and how they communicate with each other. And then Tim goes in and uses some of these light-based tools, the sort of things that Lynn was talking about, to like perturb or knock parts of the brain off balance. And the hope is that we can start to use these models and the data to see how the brain compensates. You know, what is it doing when you push one area down? How do the other areas kind of like, you know, stand up and do its job? Okay, so that was one future direction. The second future direction that we are very excited about is so-called neuromorphic computing. Um, on the left, I'm showing you a graph of the famous Moore's Law, which captures this rapid, this exponential growth in computing capability that's really reshaped the second half of the 20th century. You know, the number of transistors and microchips is doubling, so you're just going, just computing power is growing exponentially. A lot of people, though, think that this growth of computing power is slowing down, and even if it's not, you know, we're spending more and more to get the next, you know, the next generation of chips. Everything's becoming more and more expensive. At the same time, these machine learning algorithms, they're resource hungry, they're expensive, and they often have a tremendous carbon footprint. You know, training these big models just chews through so much electricity. And so something we're very excited about is building brain-inspired hardware. The brain does a lot of cool stuff, uses less energy than an old-fashioned light bulb. Um, that's amazing. You know, how does it do that? And so we're leveraging, I think, one of the real strengths of Davis. It's a very interdisciplinary place with a very, like, you know, horizontal organization. And so we have this big interdisciplinary team of people from engineering, from physics, from neuroscience, from computer science. And we're all coming together to try and think about building hardware inspired by the structure of the brain at every level you know, building small circuits inspired by the structure of neurons all the way up to the large-scale organization of how these things talk about. It's sort of a really fun, you know, collaboration to be in because 
we're switching from talking about the details of synapses, you know, to someone's MOSFET, to like, it's, you know, sometimes it makes my head spin, but it's super, super fun. Okay, so the last future direction we're very excited about is using generative AI to understand generative modeling in the brain. The generative AI is the stuff that Tim used to make that painting of people at NeuroFest, to write that sonnet. Um, and these algorithms can write essays, they can create pictures, they can compose music. Um, again, this is from last year, so already out of date. This is a picture generated by an AI that won an art competition, um, very controversial. This is an AI given the famous girl with a pearl earring painting and asked to extend it. And so, you know, paint outside the frame, what do you think the rest of the picture looks like? And that's what it came up with. Okay, so one way a lot of these generative AI models work is they learn patterns in data by teaching a network to reproduce the data. So let's say, you know, I'm tired of all the pictures of dogs on the internet, I want to train up my own dog generator. What I could do is I could start, I could take a bunch of pictures of dogs and I could pass them through a neural network and ask it to reconstruct the picture of the dog. You know, this might be early in training, so it's, it's trying to learn what Lola the dog looks like. It gives you the input, and right now it's sort of blurry, and you train the network, train the network, until it gets better. And the idea is you basically squeeze what it's doing through this bottleneck, and so you're really forcing the network. It's like you gave the network a small piece of paper, and so it really needs to learn the right features about what makes a dog. You know, floppy ears, long snout, it needs to learn those ingredients that come up with dog. These are exactly those latent variables that um, Karen was talking about. So we can train this network on a large amount of data. And once we've done that, once it's learned some stru underlying structure of what makes a dog, we can use the network now to generate new images of dog. You know, maybe it's learned that dogs have these kinds of ears and these kinds of tails. It can generate new combinations. And so now it's generated another dog. And you know you can keep doing this, and it'll keep generating new dogs from the structure it's learned. So this approach has been extremely powerful. Um, and what, some of the things we're thinking about is, do brains use similar strategies? You know, maybe do cognitive brain areas learn these high-level patterns and then pass them through to the rest of the brain for like the sensory or motor areas to reconstruct stuff? You know, if I say, shut your eyes and think of a dog, what's your brain doing? How is it generating those images? Another thing we're very interested in is, you know, the brains seem to some extent surprisingly noisy. There's a lot more randomness in brains than you would think, given that it's such an exquisite system. What is all that randomness doing? Why do you have all that noise? Um, one possibility is that maybe some of that randomness is there to allow us to come up with new possibilities. Um, that's true in these generative networks. And so we're exploring that possibility in the brain. OK, so to come back around, you know, I think we had a very exciting moment for both basic and clinical science. We have this exquisitely complex, you know, billions of billions of neurons system. That's the brain that we're studying. And we have these new approaches to studying it. We have these artificial agents that we can study like they were biological agents, and then are giving us insight into how these networks work. And we have these new machine learning tools that you know, could listen in to that conversation in a supermarket in Davis and figure out you know, that person's buying cheese, that person's arguing about the price of cauliflower. Um, so we have this tremendous potential to understand the brain and improve brain health. Um, these techniques are allowing us the potential for much faster research. We can build these machine learning models to build structure out of data. You saw that with, you know, Lynn's talk, Will's talk, Karen's talk, we're just like doing things you know, faster, better. It's giving us a lot more leverage. It's giving us the possibility of better technology, you know, faster, cheaper computers that aren't as bad for the environment. And many, many impacts on everyday life. You know, you can generate as many cat videos as you want now just from your generative AI. Now, these techniques have a lot of potential. At the same time, I think it's important that we, you know, stay informed and stay ahead of them and kind of keep them human-centered you know, really make sure that they're doing, that we're in control of them. And so it's a very exciting time, and I would sort of encourage you to learn as much as you can about these techniques, because they're really changing a lot about the world. Awesome. So with that, thank you, um, and I'll take some questions.
Hello. Thank you for your very inspirational talk. Um, I had a question in regards to brain-inspired hardware. Um, so it seems like a very interesting topic, and I'm wondering how are you going about the process of designing this hardware? And in your opinion, do you think we are fundamentally limited by our current state of technology and the computational power it takes to have these brain-inspired algorithms and hardware run? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I think, in, in, in some sense, the answer to both of those questions goes together. So, you know, yes, we are limited by our current state of technology, but that's, you know, that's the exciting part. That's where the research is. And so right now, I feel like it's a pretty big tent. You know, a lot of people are trying different approaches, different materials for what we're making the neurons and synapses out of, but also, you know, different biological details, like what details of a neuron should we actually copy in hardware and what's irrelevant? That's a pretty fundamental question. You know, something we've been talking a lot about is if you go look at a neuron, you take a neuroscience class, there are different ways of modeling a neuron. You can just think of it as a simple input-output machine. You can think of it as doing some sort of complex transformation. What should we be capturing in hardware? Um, if, you know, from like a bunch of the talks earlier, synapses have this really intriguing structure where you have an electrical signal come in, it gets switched into a slow chemical signal, and then gets switched back into a fast electrical signal. Do we want to recapitulate that kind of two types of signaling or not? Um, you know, I'm answering your question with lots of other questions, but that's really just to say that this is a very active area of research, and we don't know many of the answers. And so it's a great space to just like, try and think about what is the right answer, what is the right approach. You know, we'll, in 10 or 20 years, I think we'll know. But at the moment, it's like this really fun field where people are trying lots and lots of different things. Hello, uh, thank you again for your talk. Um, my question kind of spins off of like the last question of the brain-inspired hardware. Like you were saying, all of these models take a lot of electricity to um, kind of train and get the output that you want. How are you looking, and you were saying how the brain actually takes very little energy for all of the computation that it does. Have you guys even, have you guys like looked into how hardware can kind of emulate the brain in terms of how if like efficiently it uses electricity or energy or, um, is that more like like electrical engineering or circuitry? Um, yeah, that was my question. Yeah, that's a great question. No, that's something we're very much thinking about. I'll just like, there are a whole bunch of answers, but I'll just highlight two. Um, so one thing is sparsity. And so the idea is a lot of the, these machine learning networks, everyone is talking to everyone. Um, you know, imagine right now I'm talking to all of you. You're not all talking to each other. But imagine you're in a room and everyone's trying to talk to everyone. That's a lot of energy. Brains are much sparser. You know, I think in Will's talk, he was talking about every neuron has some number of possible connections, but you only have like maybe 1,000 or so friends, or if you're a neuron, or like you know, 50 or so friends, if you're me, um, that you're talking to. And that's much, much more efficient because you're not sending all of these signals all over the place. And if you just step back and think about it, it seems almost silly. Why would you have everyone talking to everyone? That seems unnecessarily wasteful. But Part of the problem then is how do you figure out who needs to talk to whom? And so that's where the kind of design and the neuroscience inspiration comes from. So that's one thing, sparsity. The second thing is the way neurons communicate, you know, they get these electrical, they get these inputs, and they integrate them for a while, and then at some point they cross a threshold and they, you know, they send like an action potential. But so they're sending these little pulses of, in, of information, but the rest of the time they're effectively quiet. And so they don't, you know, they're not talking a lot. These machine learning architectures, in some sense, they're always on. They're not using these little bursts of information. They're constantly sending a signal. And so the idea is, you know, can we make them a little bit, like talk to fewer people and make them talk less often? Um, and both of those should really, really help. And you know, if you look at the brain's energy budget, which we've been trying to do, things like spiking is actually a huge fraction of that. And so you want to use your communication efficiently, especially to send messages over long distances, because that's expensive. Um, and so maybe I'll say a third thing. You know, th a third part of the brain is you have this very intriguing, you talk a lot to people around you and not too much to neurons far away. Again, that's pretty efficient. You don't have to, you're not always sending, well, I guess emails are efficient, but you're not really sending a long distance letter. I just want to know if you see in the future a time where we'll be able to find out live. Instead of waiting for the 
Yeah. I'm just yeah, there you go. <laughs> just wanted to know if you see that in the future. Yeah, I mean, you know, some, I, I think there's some things we'll probably never be able to see, but there's a lot more that we will be able to see than we do see today. And some of that is, you know, the imaging methodologies are getting better. And we're also getting better at combining data from different sources. You know, there's some ways I could look at your brain. I could be doing, like, MRI of different kinds. I could be doing EEG and so on. And we're starting, some of these tools are giving us ways to stitch those modalities together and so we can get a more comprehensive look at your brain um, by kind of like, you know, putting these pieces of the puzzle together. Where that will run out, I don't know. Um, but I'm certainly optimistic that we're going to be able to see a lot more than we used to. It, uh, it seems to me that uh, the, the theme for today is, is this interdisciplinary approach where uh, departments and, and experts are working together. And it, it, it's very exciting. It's sort of the hallmark of, of UC Davis. How does that actually happen? How do, how do you bring people from AI or, or these other disciplines into your, what, what shall I call it, lab or, or uh, team to, to, to work together? And, and is, it, is it a short-term collaboration? Is it a long-term collaboration? And, and who drives that? Yeah, those are all great questions. And you know, I very much think it is interdisciplinary science is the future. Like, I feel like I'm always just scrambling to learn the things I need to. You know, I'll, I'll point to a few different things. Um, I think the cent like interdisciplinary centers, like the Center for Neuroscience, are great um, because it means you've got all these people in the same space doing like synergistic stuff. It's almost never short term. It kind of has to be long term because you spend so much time just figuring out how to talk to each other. You know, you're not really talking to the same language for a while, and then you start to. You know, like I collaborated with both um, Tim and Lynn, both at the center, and we've been talking, you know, once a week for a year, and then, then the ideas start to emerge as we are really speaking um, the same language. Um, I think interdisciplinary funding mechanisms are often very helpful. Just being on a, gr writing a grant together kind of forces you to think about how the ideas fit together. And then you have the money for things like shared grad students, shared space, and so on. Um, I think Davis is especially good at that because they have these interdisciplinary grad groups. And so I'm in two departments, I'm part of the center, I'm part of two grad groups. And so you kind of have this network of overlapping institutes and organizations. And so, you know, in some sense, you're kind of, kind of creating almost like the physical infrastructure, infrastructure of the center, the kind of financial infrastructure of like shared grants and things, and then almost like this logistic organizational infrastructure of these like interdigitating grad groups. Um, and a lot of stuff happens in these like casual conversations, things you think about. It's kind of like the slow sort of exploratory process. Um, but it feels like very fertile when it's working. And I think it is working. Thank you, Dr. Chowdhury. I think we're out of time. Thank you.